Welcome to the Too Posh Podcast. I am Gabrielle. I am a former New York Mafia princess, originally from Austria. I am the mother of three and the owner of Too Posh Boutique. And here with my beautiful co-host, Marcella, my daughter. Hello, I'm Marcella. I'm a dancer, choreographer, model, and designer for Too Posh. And I say whatever the f- I want. Hi, my name is Cruz. I am a stylist. I also own the Society Salon in the design district and I am a short little Mexican with a big personality. What will they say next? Welcome to the Two Posh Podcast. Jackson. Already. John Huffman. Already. <laughs> we are so honored to have you on our show today. Two Posh baby. So can we start with how far we go back? I don't even know how long it's been. But it's been a long time. You know, you were in my life at a very special moment, you and your family. So maybe 20 years? Maybe 20 years, yeah. I think tw- I'm, th- I'm saying 20. About 20 or 24 years ago. I have to go by the kids who yeah. think I know them. <laughs> not that they grown. <laughs> they see me in random places and be like, he didn't remember me. <laughs> so I said, my mom is Gabrielle. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, no, that, that definitely helps. I'm 20. <laughs> Something years ago, I, you know what? I remember. <laughs> That's very so funny. we met um, Jackson when he still went by the name of John, and I didn't he was even go about it then. But that's okay. You didn't. You went by the name of Jane Brothers back then. No, I mean I. You know, it was. What was I've it? never went by my government. We don't do government names in the hood. You know what I'm saying? Uh, well, how? What did that's you why go we by? Change our names so much. Don't you know that? No. You think Tupac's name, or let's say. Let's say Tupac's name is one of the only rappers in the world that goes by his actual birth name. Everybody else ain't got this. Dr. Dre ain't Dr. Dre. <laughs> vanilla Ice ain't Vanilla Ice. MC Hammer ain't MC Hammer. Oh, Vanilla Ice. See. Mm. None of these There's names. a bunch of stuff going on with that with you. <laughs> well, Hammer too. But anyway, it's um, it's all good, you know? I uh, Even my grandmother would call me JJ. I was born... Born John Henry Huffman the fourth. So that was my government name. But I used to tell them men, my grandfather, my daddy, I used to tell them, if y'all don't like each other when I grow up, I'm not naming my kid after y'all. Oh. And they never liked each other. Well, I didn't think they liked each other enough. So that didn't ever bother me that that uh I didn't name my my only son my my first son, not my only son, but my first son after them what did you name your first son eli mm. eli is my little bo- my big boy my, my <laughs> little boy is uh lincoln oh nice names but yeah and you mm. have two girls right mm-hmm. two hannah? girls hannah and charlie and they all named after people for a reason that they can be proud of what yeah. are they uh let's see Eli, I'm the fourth, right? So my great grandfather's dad, so my great great grandfather, his name was Elijah. And my wife at the time, her grandfather's name was Eli. Oh, wow. So we found common ground. Yeah. <laughs> and we needed as much common ground as we could find, baby. <laughs> so that worked out. And then Hannah came along, and we just loved her now name Hannah, but she's Hannah Helen after my grandmother, who got me out of foster care. So she was she was the most incredible woman to me ever. So she got my my first girl got named name. after my grandma Helen, and then uh, let's see, Charlie was my ex loved Charlie Wilson. From the Gap Band, so he was a soul cat lover. So I let her have that one, and then we put the Jane on there because her parents had to have something. I think Jane was her uh, grandmother, something like that. And then Lincoln, we just love Lincoln, but uh, his middle name is Stewart after my boy Stewart. No way, yeah. that's <laughs> so cool. After Stewart Marriott. So, so can we back up a little bit and tell us where you were born and? Your childhood a little bit, just short. You want to know where I was born? Okay, I was born 
on the east side of Cleveland, Ohio, in a $7,000 house that was full of love, but not possessions. So there wasn't much in there with my grandmother's house on the east side of Cleveland. My parents were teenagers, 15 and 17 years old. They were encouraged to, to, to abort me, but they didn't. I'm grateful for that. Um, but yeah, east side of Cleveland is a tough part of the world to live in and grow up in. You know, my grandfather was killed on that side of the of the tracks by the police. My uncle's on death row today. And I'd probably be dead if I'd have stayed on the east side of Cleveland because people with big personalities and a lot of ambition tend to not make it out very easy. So I am grateful my, grand, my, my mom and my dad joined the Air Force at 18, both of them when they turned 18. Really? Yeah. So that got us out of the hood for a minute. But my dad swindled custody from my mom while she was in basic training, so I never grew up with her. But then he was just a hood kid, just with a hat that said military. He wasn't following the rules. So he was pretty rebellious and lost custody of me and my brother to the state of Nevada. And then we went in the system, and then, uh, yeah, so. How old was your brother? Two years younger than me. Okay. So we were probably like nine and seven or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we went into the system. And in foster care, I didn't really fit in well there because I didn't understand why we were there. I ran away a lot. At that age? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty rebellious early. I was pretty like, I can raise me better than you crazy people. <laughs> so... And they getting me lit in here, y'all. <laughs> you the haven't sippy even cup. had I know, he's the a sippy two cup. Sip. I, I'm a lightweight. Oh. I don't drink. See, and it's got they got liquid <laughs> pouring out of it to make me look crazy. It ain't me. When you see this happen, it ain't me. <laughs> so, no, my my uh, my time in foster care was not long because I was so nuts. So my grandmother came and got us out of foster care. We went back to Cleveland, stayed with her for a couple of years, maybe a year. Eighth grade, moved. To Texas. No, with, I actually moved with my mom. No? With your grandmother? Yeah, my grandmother came and got us out of foster care. No, but moved to Texas with you. No, 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 no. We moved to Cle back to Cleveland okay. with my grandmother. And uh, was there for maybe a year or two. And then my mom finally came and got us. She was uh, stationed in Korea at the time. So she came and got me. My brother went with my dad. I spent a year with her. And she couldn't handle me. So, <laughs> I said, uh, I heard on the phone one day, she was talking to her husband, talking about, oh, we're going to be moving to, uh, we're going to be moving to Ramstein, Germany. And I'm like, I ain't moving to Ramstein, Germany. Again, being rebellious. So I called my dad and I said, hey, my mom said it's, she's going to be moving to Ramstein, Germany some, you know, at the end of the summer. So I'm going to come stay with you for the summer and I'm going to move back here to Vacaville, California. When she, when she leaves and I'm just going to do my own thing. I was 14 years old. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So my dad said, okay. So I said, don't tell her, but I'm just coming, tell her I'm just coming to visit you. So he didn't listen. He told her I came home from school that day. She was crying. And I was like, yeah, I just don't want to go to Ramstein, Germany. She's like, fine. You can go live with your daddy. So I went and with my dad and about six months after that, I came home from school and he was, he had the whole car packed up with my brother, my little brother, my other little brother, and my, no, my little sister. And then the, the car had stuff all in it. And he was like, I think you got this. Huh? I got to go. What? Yeah. He said, I think you got this. He said, I think you, you should stay here. And I'm looking at the car and I'm like, I think I have to stay here. There's not room in that car. <laughs> but he had he was being run out of town. No way. And uh I stood on that curb with my friend Tamiko Mitchell, who was my best friend, and saw them drive off. And they left the house they left me at the he left me at the house. I threw parties in there for two weeks until the neighbors realized that they were gone and told the police and You were by yourself? Yeah. At fourteen? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, see that drip eating? So, I know, I just, that's by design. I hear you, Jolie, wherever you at, girl. I'm going to tell you about these drinks. 
right. So, no, it was, uh, yeah, so they, and I, he was right, though. I should have stayed. I should not have went with him. Well, what happens next at 14 by yourself? I was, I loved to dance. I had really great friends. I stayed in their closets without their parents knowing, and I'd sneak in their room in the middle of the night hide behind the dirty clothes hamper, go to sleep, wake up in the morning before the parents woke up, knock on the front door, say, hey, Miss Campisi, I get a ride to school. She'd be like, yeah, sure, come on in. I'd wink at Chad, get a little food, we go to school. After school, she was a single mom. We'd be at the, we'd have the house from 2.30 to 7 by the time she got off work. We moved the furniture, watched MTV music videos, and danced all day. And that changed everything. <laughs> like how? Um, I ended up uh, having a group of friends that really loved music and loved dancing. And we would enter all these dance contests to make money in, in adult clubs. We weren't supposed to be in those clubs. And uh, What clubs? Monopolies and City Lights in Dallas, Texas. What? Yeah. I've never heard of those. Yeah, I mean, you look up Monopolies... Monopolies was like, North, it was off North First Highway. City Lights was oh. off of it was South Dallas. And so me and Rob and Coco and Earthquake, we all got our start there. And then what we were doing was attractive to the guy that owned the nightclub. So his name was Tommy Kwan. And Tommy thought we had enough talent to do it for real, so he gave us a warehouse to practice in there, it didn't have no heat, it didn't have no AC. So in the hot in the summer, it was as hot as you could think. It was <laughs> empty and just scorching hot. But he had some big old mirrors and windows, mirrors up. And yeah, we just uh we love to dance and we love to perform. And we did not it kept us out of trouble. You know, even when we got in a lot of trouble. When you spend eight hours a day dancing in front of mirrors because you think you're hot, <laughs> you know, it tends to reduce your risk of drama. We got in our, we had our fair share. We fought a lot and got in trouble occasionally, but the time we spent was well received. <laughs> so you performed like then for like, real like performances for working that hard for so long. Yeah. So, you know, one day I, the real catalyst was DJ earthquake came to us and said, I got to, you guys are great dancers and performers at our clubs that we have. And I'm the DJ. I got a song. And so he gave us ice ice baby and that changed everything. Tell us about that. Yeah. Ice ice baby ended up being, you know, I remember the day we received that, and we just drove around in Rob's Mustang and, you know, just literally listening to it, not expecting what would eventually happen at all. But we loved it. We thought it was cool. We made our routines to it. We, and then we met a writer. And the writer and Rob wrote the record, Ice Ice Baby, the lyrics, over one evening. The writer asked us, we, we asked the writer, say, hey, Chocolate, his name was Chocolate, MC Smooth at the time. By the way, another name, MC Smooth. He's not born MC Smooth, <laughs> Gabrielle. <laughs> not, I'm learning these things. He's not an MC Smooth on his birth certificate, just so you know. Anyway, so MC, MC Smooth wrote the record with Rob, and, you know, the rest is just history. Who is Rob? Vanilla Ice. Vanilla Ice. Ice Ice Baby. And, um, yeah, so we, we, uh, it was, I, I could see the, that day, like it was yesterday and we were just so proud of it. Now it was just me, Rob and Mark and, uh, smooth in the, in the house that day, getting that record written. And next thing you know, Record executives were showing up in Dallas, Texas, trying to ask us what we wanted to do with ourselves. So, 
million dollars came through the pike. Millions of dollars came after that. And I went from sleeping in those closets to touring the world, being picked up by limousines, taken to the airport to perform and be the first rap group to perform in most places on the planet. So a lot of people do not know that about you, do they? Mm. Well, people, I don't really, I never really like sat there and like walk around telling people about anything like that. But right. I, I constantly just kept creating things and just spent a whole lifetime. Now I've spent a lifetime creating things that are special, partnering with great producers and songwriters and artists and entrepreneurs and investors and and the little engine that burns inside of me is just remembering being that that kid who used his talent to make a way for himself, you know, instead of being caught up in the system or joining gangs or being doped up or I had every reason to do all that. You know, when you don't have parents that are asking you where you're at, what you're doing, I think I have a lot of options of what you can do with your time. But I instinctually knew that it wasn't a wise thing for us. We, we, viewed, we viewed what we did at that time as athletes. If you look at that stuff, we were serious about working out. We were serious about committing to our craft. And we were serious about being the best. How old were you then? 15 to... I was on the road from 15 to 20 to the world. Really? Mm-hmm. It was always my formal years, and I got the chance to learn under executives that were some of the best business people in our industry because we were generating so much revenue. When you're, when you're selling, it's the fastest selling album in history, one of them, sold 16 million albums in like full length albums in six months. So it's like insane the amount of money was coming in. So that drew out some legendary executives, Charles Koppelman and Daniel Glass, and, and, um, you know, just so many really incredible leaders in the music industry that had been doing it for so long. So, you know, there's a difference between the front of the tour bus and the back of the tour bus. But back of the tour bus, you can pretty much get into any kind of craziness you want to get into. Front of the tour bus, you know, executives leave their agreements that they're reviewing, or you hear them negotiating deals in between cities, or meetings with different other leaders in our industry. And uh, I loved being in front of that tour bus because I would read the contracts and I would say to Bill, he was this bus driver, he was a burly, long beard, been driving buses for 20 plus years, band after band after band, famous band after famous band. And I used to be, Bill, what, what does Ford Motor Company want to give us 17 Mustangs for? And Bill was like, you know that music video where you were, with the Mustangs in the music video. Ford Motor Company thinks you guys can help them sell more Mustangs. I was like, oh, what? Crazy. What? They want to, we, they think we can sell Mustangs? Yeah. And I said, do they know that they can't see the back of the Mustang and Ice Ice Baby because we were out of gas and we were pushing it in the music video. What? And they were like, he's like, what? I was like, yeah, you can't see the back of the Mustang in the video because we were pushing it. It was out of gas. We had no money. What is, now they want to give us Mustangs? This is crazy, Bill. He's like, yeah, they want to give you all some Mustangs. So I say that because you learn those lessons in the front of the bus. You learn those lessons from the executives. And if you're paying attention, you know, which I was, I was so grateful to be there in that position because I knew what the alternative could have been the whole time. Right. So I took it serious. I was like, I'm about to study everything. I'm about to get as many business cards as I can get. You a music director? Hmm, can I get your business card? They'd be like, what do you want my business card? Ain't you the choreographer? I was like, uh-huh. I don't know why I want your business card, but give it to that me. guy said that you something special around here, and I need, I may need to know you in the future. So, yeah. 